Hello everyone, uh, I'm Evan Evan, this is Composer, and today we're joined by Dallas Crane. Hey guys, how you doing? Steven Stratbert. Hey everybody. And Kyle Juhas. Hey guys. And let's talk about scoring. All right. So uh, I have a question from Scott Mueller. He asked uh, late last night about today's impending solar flare. So he asks, uh, is anyone else unplugging all their gear and hard drives from power and the internet tomorrow before the solar flare hits? Mm. Better safe than sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, one of the guys says, uh, Jamal Brashan says, solar flare, when? Tomorrow. You know what time by chance? I'm trying to figure that out. George Gatewood says, Krillin level or Goku level? No. <laughs> when you guys are saying it, I was trying not to throw in like, a DVD reference. I'm like, no, don't do it, don't do it. So thank you guys for doing that. <laughs> and then Dallas, you asked, does it hit the whole globe or only those getting like the daylight? And so I looked that up. Oh, yeah. And it turns out it takes, uh, let's see, uh, if you haven't looked it up, uh, how many seconds does it take for um, a plasmic discharge from the sun, known as a solar flare, to mm -hmm. reach planet Earth? Oh, interesting. Uh, eight minutes? Well, I mean, I think so. What, what's eight times uh, 60? 400. Well, it's 500 seconds because it, it travels a little slower than the speed of light. Oh, I okay. see. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 500 seconds. So I would say, yeah, it's pretty much wherever, whatever side of the planet's facing the sun within about eight minutes of of that of sunset, <laughs> then you're, you're going to be hit by it. So that happened today. And that's sort of like got me thinking about I uh, wanted to share some of my experience and tips and things I've learned over the last really 30, 30 years about protecting your equipment mm. and one of the one of the first things you should do is get something called an ISO bar that's an isolation transformer and ISO bar essentially converts electricity to magnetism and then by not touching the next point and just by transferring electricity via magnetism to another con connector, you get a uh, connectionless access to electricity. And so you use these to get your studio gear or whatever isolated on its own kind of semi-circuit, if you will. And uh, so that's how you can do that. You plug your devices into the other end of that but on the inside, it's converting electricity to magnetism. Magnetism hops over nothingness and uh, gets converted back to electricity. And then you plug your equipment into that. And that'll protect you from, I mean, spikes and surges. That'll help with that. Um, but um, like interference from other devices that would normally have been connected on that network. And maybe you, you can't get your studio on a separate uh, circuit or maybe you need to... Um, you know, just to isolate that in some way. So the ISO bar is a great way to do that. Yeah, I, I used to get um, noise coming out of my speakers whenever, like, a text message would come in through my phone because the signal would travel through and the speaker would pick it up. Well, uh, actually, that's microwave transmission from yeah. your cell phone, and you hear that. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Well, maybe if it was plugged into the wall and charging, you might get that. Uh, but you might also get that because it's microwave. Yeah, it's probably, yeah. And if you mm. keep that on a wire or close to your wire or near your equipment or whatnot, uh, that could do that. Yeah. So yeah, you should probably turn off all all microwave transmission devices, including microwaves. Don't be microwaving <laughs> food when you're recording. <laughs> <laughs> the bell might go off. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I've also got... See, I wasn't worried about the flare just because I've got the clean power converter. So even if something were to happen, I don't think it would get through that. Yeah. And there's like four steps of... Of protection. Yeah, well, protection. yeah. I mean, that's the next thing I was going to recommend is make sure you get yourself like a, a power conditioner. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes the, the, the electricity and it puts it into a buffer, a transformer buffer, and then it, it takes it out at a very steady rate as opposed to, you know, you, your cost, if you were to analyze your electrical circuitry in your, in your, in your feed from your city... Uh, in your studio, you'd probably be getting brownouts and little spikes oh, and everything. It goes down to can go down to like 98 uh, uh, volts and then like 125, and it just it's just all over the place. 
So by, with a power conditioner, you protect your gear, especially if you have sensitive gear like uh, microphones, powered microphones, and um, computer, you know? I mean, your computer is very sensitive. And so by putting one of those uh, power transformers with some very high joules of protection, uh, you can protect yourself against spikes, blackouts, drops. Another thing you can do, and this is what I what I also have on mine, I've got a bunch of these things all daisy chained together, is get a battery backup unit. And the battery backup unit basically gives you electricity from an hour ago, you know, because it's like going through the battery, but it actually keeps kind of a reserve, but then it like gives you about a minute ago electricity, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if the power goes out, you know, for one, you can keep working. That's what some people think is the best benefit of a battery backup unit, but really it's because you're just really putting a lot of protection between anything that can happen with the electricity and your gear. It gives you some time to save and shut down. And, right, right. You know, but if you do get a big enough one, you know, and you've got deadlines, um, then that can really help solve work because you can just keep going, you know. You can get ones that last four hours. You know, I have one that lasts an hour, but that's with a lot of gear. I have a lot of screens, powerful computers, a lot of stuff hooked up there. And an hour on this stuff is no joke. That, that takes a lot of battery. It's, it's really heavy. It's this massive thing behind, this, by, behind the uh, system here. How much does one of those cost? Uh, not too bad. I mean, yeah. uh, if a really good quality one can be like 800 bucks, but um, a, a prosumer level one, maybe 200 bucks. Yeah, 200. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a real serious system, maybe it's just, uh, you know, kind of you're a student and you have an, an iMac and uh, maybe two little speakers, I mean, you can get... 60 bucks 80 bucks wow. you can get a, a little one and all it does is it'll buy you you know a few minutes of time so you can save everything and turn save it off. everything yeah. because that stuff just damages the computer when it powers oh, off yeah. like that oh, yeah. and of course if you like live in New Orleans or Florida and you guys are accustomed to thunderstorms and high humidity um, lightning strike and um, what do they call those with the with the stakes in the ground the uh, Lightning poles yes, or something. Yeah, like lightning, lightning rods. rods. Yeah, lightning like rods. rods. Yeah. You know, there's lightning rods everywhere. But you know, sometimes that can throw a surge at the house. I I know plenty of people who have had all their stuff ruined in their house because of uh, lightning storms, like in New Orleans, where mm. where I have a bunch of friends. It's true. Yeah. yeah. You know, especially in Florida, we have a lot of freak thunderstorms, especially during the summer. So it's a very good if you're mm. a at home producer, it's a great thing to think of. If you anyone out there in Florida watching this please yeah always take note of that take note of your your environment you don't really think about that too much it's like even when you mentioned the humidity aspect there it's that's wow. such really important things to think about and it's something i had a kind of encounter coming from florida to california here i mean like i would change the strings of my guitar which is something kind of unrelated and uh you know play for a couple hours and the next day you can already see like the wear and like the rust almost coming out. i have very acidic yeah. hands though by the way uh yeah. it's, the sweat is just is just horrible. you kind of have to uh you've got that like a uh, rebar or whatever going down the middle of the guitar neck and you have to yes. screw it around for the humidity too, right? Exactly. Yeah, you, your your truss rod will be yeah, messed yeah, up. Rod, exactly. Yeah. Your your action then will get kind of thrown off. It's, it's all these little factors you just don't think of. Really yeah. good point. Really good point. Yeah, because here in California you don't really think about that. It's very dry here. It's dry here. Yeah, exactly. It's basically a desert and when it's in winter it's basically Antarctica except not this cold. <laughs> <laughs> but it's dry. It's a dry mm -hmm. desert. It's dry. Cold. And uh, really actually here... And in, in places that are dry like that, you have to worry about humidity on the opposite effect is that you might need to add a humidifier yes. to your studio or you might need to add a humidifier in your equipment room or also instruments like you mentioned, you know, they can get really damaged by fluctuations in humidity as well. So if you can kind of like uh, have a, a thermostat meter in your in your studio uh, or, or office, then you can gauge that and be watching all the time you want to keep it between you know 35 and 65 percent humidity like right in there you know and if it gets too dry that that is damaging you know you don't notice you know you get to go have a glass of water but your equipment and your, all your furniture and everything in your studio doesn't it's just, <laughs> exactly you're a dry state yeah. so speaking of glasses don't uh, don't bring one of these into the studio <laughs> you want to have like something like this because i've had a lot of this thing's fallen over and we'll, you know i mean it's probably prevented a lot of accidents and so yeah. uh, those are spill proof spill yeah proof yeah That's actually a really you good could, point yeah yeah you can yeah. knock those over and they don't yeah. spill so the only time they open up for you to drink is when you push the button yes. on the side and then when you let go of the button the spring thing closes up the hatch again 
and it, and so if you if you knock it over or it falls on the floor yeah. or it drops over you won't get water on your equipment you won't get coffee on your equipment and uh, that one is the Contigo yes. brand you can find it at like, Walmart Target Costco it's a very popular brand it's Amazon it's like 20 bucks yeah. you can get various sizes I mean it's, uh-huh. you know so who were you were telling me Kyle you. something happened to your computer or you was that you or someone? I'm forgetting, but like yeah. their whole computer, their keyboard got all this water on it. Oh, and no. it was yeah. like, we're totally yeah. ruined. It's like a nightmare. Yeah, please. Yes, don't say that. Yeah. Yeah. Put, put everything on stilts before <laughs> <laughs> leave. That's actually very common in Florida as well. You'll just find stilt houses everywhere. Yeah. Just, I guess, just for flooding mm. issues or whatever. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. But. I also say, don't eat. Oh, yeah. studio. Don't eat. Don't eat yeah, in your studio because it's just going to build up. You don't think it's going to make a big problem, you know. You're going to get one crumb, but just do that, you know, a hundred times, and I get a hundred crumbs, and then you've got mold issues, and then it's just yeah. Just have a no, a no eating, no drinking policy or a protected drink policy, and in the studio. And as far as like showing clients to bringing in clients, you want to try try to be as presentable as you can. Sure. From the greatest, you, you know, you don't want to. Yeah, you, you don't know, want crumbs. So, and you don't want crumbs. You might not notice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trip on a <laughs> banana peel. <laughs> you can always tell somebody who leaks in the studio, too, because they'll just look at their keyboard and you'll see all that like, little food fragments stuck in the oh. keys. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, oh, yeah, that's, I don't want to touch that. But, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, Dallas, you had something you wanted to tell yeah. everyone about um, uh, handwriting, I believe, and yeah, engraving. I've got some ideas. I want to see what you guys think. Um, you know, everything we do is digital, and a lot of the processes that we have, we can hand off to people. Um, but I wanted to know what you guys think. Is it important that we know how to write our own music? Um, like hand write it down on a piece of paper, mm-hmm. you know, actually with a piece of, you know, with a pencil, with staff notation. Is that something important? And then is it important for us to know what good engraving looks like as composers? Well, let me start with Kyle on that one. Um, being somebody who's more of a audio guy, yeah. uh, what do you feel about the world of notating your music? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things where you don't really think it's as important. Especially nowadays, you just mentioned with all the digital processes and stuff like that, you don't really think, well, I'm never going to have to worry about this. But it's what, I think it's kind of an art form that you really should maintain in a way. I think it's just good to know. And one of those, one of the, it kind of just becomes those aspects of the more you know, the more you're going to be able to use it. So even if it's something that you're not going to regularly find yourself using, someone such as myself... Uh, it still is good just to know something so you can reference it, you know, or or if you, you know, say, I mean, you never really know where technology is going to go, but obviously we're just advancing at a very accelerated rate nowadays. But coming, like I said, just just having more of that classical sort of discipline, I think it it always comes in handy. So I I don't think it's something where you have to practice every day and really really study hard, you know, very very immensely. But at the same time, it's just one of those things where it's a skill to have. And it's, just, mm-hmm. it's, always, it's, it's never going to not benefit you, you know. Yeah, so I think that's well said. I think that's just how I would view that as a. Engineer. How about yourself, Stephen? What do you think? Uh, I would say, as when you're working with other musicians, it can make things a lot easier if you're playing certain parts, and they can already read music. It just it simplifies the whole process, and uh, yeah, I think it's if you can spend like you know a couple times a week, just make that like a little habit. That you can just practice it's it's definitely mm. a great great skill i mean it can accelerate your learning too yeah. if you if you if you know how to yeah. learn yeah. actually that that does remind me i've done a few sessions where i'm just hanging out with the musician you know basically just sitting next to them in this small little studio and they've got their instrument and then i think of an idea and you know mm-hmm. bam i pull out a piece of paper and you know, draw the staff lines draw out the idea it's not super long or anything but i can get the idea across yeah, if you, can get your, if you can get your mind into that shape where you can, without even an instrument, you can just, in, with relative pitch, um, internal, internally, if you can get that to the point where you can sketch out something, boy, that, that can come in handy in a spot. Oh, yeah. On your way to London on the airplane, in a <laughs> session, last minute, you need to rewrite a theme. <laughs> oh, jeez, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, I'm a little biased, I guess, because I started out doing handwritten music. You know, uh-huh. just sitting in high school, like history class, and I have the big eleven by seventeen paper that I printed myself with the staff lines, and I do the big band chart, and then I hand write out the parts. Oh, nice! And give it to the school band to play, that kind of stuff. So, did that get you accustomed to um, 
sort of like engraving techniques and that kind of thing? Uh, well, it was really messy. I remember I showed it to <laughs> Gordon Goodwin once. He was flying through town. He's like, man, you need to clean this up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I had, I had to learn that. But definitely got me interested in the idea that players see specific things and they expect specific things in their parts. And so that... Uh, opened up the way for you know the empathetic composer approach to know to write for you musicians and know how to convert your authentic ideas um, to something that they can perform. That's a mm. strength for everybody. Yeah, that's that's my thought. And I'll, on and it. I'll say and I'll add to that uh, to the idea of what are the pros and cons or pros for of notating music um, that it does allow you to express your musical self uh, in ways that uh, can be beyond uh, even the capabilities of even current instruments. Uh, your The notation, if you don't know all of it, seems like something that is this information that you can learn. But actually, once you have soaked up all the theory of music notation, you realize there's a point where, you know, okay, so there's these five lines and they are helpfully representational of pitch and then rhythm in the other direction and time. And you can kind of do whatever you want and they draw a little dinosaur if you want. It really doesn't matter. You can, as a, well, however you want to express yourself on that page. If you really understand kind of like what you mean by it, you can do doodles and all kinds of interesting information which makes sense to you and uh, that can be your musical language um, and how you express yourself and and then um, with with the proper you know classical training traditional training you can then convert that into actual parts that they'll be able to understand and read or not you know you can have it stay abstract and it splits out to everybody and then the conductor or or uh, whoever needs to explain to the musicians what the different symbologies mean you can completely create it for yourself so I think in that's one sense Notation uh, is one of the most open ways that you can organize sound as a composer um, into some kind of an abstract form that can be put down and ratified 90, 95, 100%. Yeah, it's kind of conceptually between, you know, even just singing into your iPhone or working with a DAW or notation. When you have that all down, you're kind of you're conceptually free um, from the restraints of those media and now suddenly when you're recording music it's your music and you can record it however you feel like you're not restricted to it it's not a language that you speak mm -hmm. now another well, thing I was oh, going to add yeah. to kind of what Steven okay. said earlier but maybe you were about to say something no so. I just had an interesting I don't know if you guys ever this is not like necessarily you guys did you know that Michael Jackson so uh, he would have this like voice recorder and he would like just throughout the day he would just if he had an idea he would just put it on this recorder and I guess that was his he couldn't read notes but somehow in order to preserve like his ideas that's oh, what yeah. he would do and he would that's, his note that's kind of a cool little way if you don't if you can't read music you could do something like that right that was his notepad and that was his notepad yeah yeah that's awesome going back to kind of like what you're saying it's like kind of nice to keep your chops up mm -hmm. on it um, really where that could help is you know if you can get your chops up to the point where you know, treble and bass clef are no problem and all of the different you know note values and sight reading rhythms and pitches and melodies and everything um, now add C clef and viola clef you know and and then you know even further from there if you want like lute writing and just like try and get just go the distance with being able to understand all the notation um, formats that the instruments read practice reading sight reading um, transpose score instead of score in C you know? um, yeah, so transposition is a really important skill oh man transposition is fantastic uh, if you can write and transpose score I mean, you can do incredible orchestration like right up, right in front of you um, but uh, you know ever since Prokofiev wrote everything in C mm -hmm. so every, that's been kind of the gold standard and mm -hmm. in Hollywood it makes sense because you have to sight read so they don't care what key you're in they just want to know is that note sharp or flat Mm. And so you just put it on every bar. Everything's in C in Hollywood. You know, right. you sight read. There's no key. It's keyless. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just it's odd if you see a key. It's like, what are we doing here? And you know, partita or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, Peter uh, Peter Karistin 
asks, hey everyone, I have some questions regarding PROs, that's uh, performance rights organizations, like BMI and ASCAP, for example, in the US. Let's say I write music for a TV commercial spot and register the piece with a PRO. Who will have to pay the fee when it broadcasts? Is it my client, the production company? Is it the brand company that is advertising or is it the TV channel, the network? I don't want to add any more costs to my clients than what they already paid for up front. And uh, he continues, if I am a member with a PRO, in my case, the Swedish STIM, S-C-I-M, will I have to register all my works? Or is it possible for me to register only some of them and do what I want with the others? For example, if I would want to write music for an indie film and don't want to bother about the PRO fees, or even if a composer would want to give away usage of their music for free or money, would they be allowed to do that? if they are a PRO member. Lastly, uh, what would you say is the pros and cons of registering with a pro, with PRO? <laughs> no pun intended. Thanks very much for your help. So um, let's start with that first one there. Yeah, so PROs... Where does the money come from? Their PROs are only a positive thing, so you should never be scared of anything with a PRO ever. Correct, yeah. So... Like they're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what I was going to add. Just in general, well, it, before we even answer the question, just yeah, know. I know, yeah, yeah. In general, ninety-five percent of the time, there are some PROs in some countries that um, dictate that dictate how you're allowed, what you're allowed to do, and not allowed to do as an artist. Austria is one place where they have a very strong, strict PRO system, where if you sign with them. You're not allowed to do X, Y, or Z. So um, I have some friends who uh, cut off their associations with the Austrian uh, PRO and then went with BMI mm -hmm. instead, for example, just to solve that problem. You don't have to belong to a PRO in the country you're in, but it does help if that's where the majority of your programs are being played because the domestic collection of royalties takes less time than waiting for all the other PROs of the world to send in their portion of what they're supposed to send in to you to your local PRO and then, then you get those. Those are called foreign royalties for whatever country is outside of your territory, right? Okay. Okay. And so, you know, it takes more than a day for those other people to get that off. Usually they bulk it, you know? Every three months, every year, they send out the foreign distributions to, you know, to everywhere else they're supposed to do it because it's has quite an administrative overhead. And that's another thing is that um, those countries uh, will take a administrative portion, a fee, out of the amount that they're going to forward on to you, to your local PRO. So if, let's say you were kind of getting more airplay in another country, you might actually sort of domestically register in that country. Okay. And then be you know not even mm -hmm. be registered with your your local one you know okay. you just wait for that to be sent off to the other one or whatnot. Um, you can also do carve outs, which is when you can carve out a territory and say, hey, I want to be PRS for Europe, and I want to be you know such and such for Asia, and I would like to be with um, BMI for the U.S. and in North America. And so you can do these carve-outs like that, but you have to have belonged to uh, one organization for, I believe, like two years. Most of them have some kind of a policy like that. Um, so, But going back to who will pay the fee, yeah, so essentially what happens is, like, if it's HBO and they, they play programs, right, um, they are, they are owed the um, writer and the publisher of the music in a visual program uh, royalties, but usually what happens is they then enter into a contract with BMI or ASCAP or some big company or jointly all together, a contract with them to say, okay, well, look, you know, based on everything we play per year and all the territories we're in and all the airplay we got, we're doing, would you accept X, you know, like $250 million a year? Will you take that? You know, and then BMI or ASCAP jointly might say, uh, sure, that sounds good. You know, so we'll divide that up as to seventy-five million per quarter, and um, just give us quarterly accounting, and then and then we'll divide it up and pay it based on our own internal weightings of everything that was supposed to be due for that period for anyone who had HBO airtime. You know, and then they submit sheets, their 
airplay sheets, their broadcast sheets, um, HBO uh, submits those those sheets, so then you can reconcile what those amounts would be. Okay. And so a lot of all these different companies, Netflix and all these different companies, uh, have to make these. Uh, they're called blanket agreements with uh, the royalty companies uh, for what's going to be their standard for for paying. Like for instance, for a long time, YouTube just didn't pay. I think I think even I'm not sure about this, but even to this day, I think they don't. Pay BMI or ASCAP anything? Yeah, I, don't, I, don't I, I don't think it's so. Very fuzzy. Yeah, but that's that's <laughs> going to change. I mean, like you know, it just takes time. You have, to, you have BMI and ASCAP just has to go through the litigation process, and that's just the way it works. You know, so that's uh, how money is sort of. Uh, it's definitely not coming out of uh, anyone's uh, pocket, though, um, uh, Peter. It's definitely not coming out of your clients. Pockets. That's something that, uh, as a matter of fact, if the client wrote a song and put it in the movie, um, they could make money themselves off of uh, their movie being uh, played on these various networks, and they can they can register as a, a songwriter or whatnot um, if they wrote some music for the film. Uh, and your other question was, do you have to register all your works? And I think that goes towards kind of like what Dallas was saying, which was there's really kind of like no there's no no's to a PRO there's only kind of yeses so it's like do you have to register all your works Just, no whatever you want to register you register and that's going to be then it's going to be up to them and their accounting departments to figure out where the airplays were and then for them to give you the money that it's collected from those people every quarter or whenever they collect the monies from. You might want to tell them about certain air dates, and that's perfect. At least with BMI, they're very fair about that. You just you know send them an email, make a phone call, show them the information on what channels it played on, on what networks it played on, where it's at, and then they do their their part on the other end. And you could get like a special payments that way, uh, or special collections up to two years retroactive, oh. legally in the U.S. Other countries mm -hmm. might be shorter or longer for retroactive. That's called retroactive payments. Uh, so then he asks, "Is it possible for me to register only some of them and do what I want with the other?" Right. Yes. Um, yep. Very good. And uh, what are the pros and cons of registering with a PRO? I mean, like I said, very rarely there's any cons, so um, it's all pros. Yeah, they're just gonna like take the headache out of it all for you and right, right, and yeah. collect. And eventually, if you're making lots of music for lots of programs that are worldwide, you can start to think about that carve out thing I was talking about. Maybe in ten years. <laughs> Perfect. What yeah. about theirs? Do they get like sort of a cut, or what's their like incentive for doing this? Uh, which one? The Who? PRO. Like, yeah, they get a little cut. They get a, okay. Yeah, but they get a, they get a little. It's gonna be. It's much harder for you to go after HBO and say, hey, you know, I, I didn't register that. You owe me personally, you know, mm -hmm. directly for whatever. Um, they might even have, a, HBO might even have an agreement with the PROs, which says that therefore then they're never going to pay anyone else unless they are with the PRO. And mm -hmm. so then they turn around and tell you, well, you got to be with the PRO mm -hmm. if you want to mm -hmm. collect this, you know. And, and it's for the best because, I mean, basically for you to get money, from someone who has money that's supposed to pay you, you probably have to sue them. Mm, you have to yeah. litigate. They're not just gonna like freely give you money. Oh, really? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll give you what you do. You know, <laughs> you have to prove it, and you've got. You know, it's gonna yeah. take litigation. That Piero means, has its weight. They yeah. can throw around. Mm. Oh, definitely. On your oh yeah, and all the big companies, all the big distribution networks, and everything. Right, and the PROs can can put a lot of legal muscle behind it. It's gonna require ten thousand dollars minimum retainer to even activate an entertainment attorney on something of that level that could be very much le leading to litigation. Um, retainer, it might only cost a thousand bucks for them to write a letter, but it would be a $10,000 retainer. Then from there, if you actually have to litigate, you're talking about you know actually getting lawyers to go into courtrooms and then th that whole process, it's gonna add up easily. It always wow. can easily add up to about a hundred grand. It'll probably be 250 grand. Hopefully you you know got about two million or more waiting for you at the end of that kind of a rainbow. And that's for a royalty check. For that, <laughs> just to go with a PRO. It's to, it costs nothing. Actually, BMI I think for to register as a publisher it costs I think one hundred twenty five dollars or two hundred fifty dollars. Something like that. Something like that. But you don't mm -hmm. have to pay to be a writer. Um, and gee, that's just nothing compared to what I just said. 
right. and, uh, and way less of a nightmare. Yes. So, uh, Mark Street in Brisbane, Australia asks, when is the time to hire an agent to find work? So, you have to remember that an agent takes 10%. So, if you're not going to, if their time is worth X, they're not going to be even interested in helping you if the 10% of what's going to be coming in is underneath the value of their time. Unless they see some kind of like incredible future value in you that they're willing to sacrifice some, you know, some growth build up with you on. So you're looking at, you know, not worrying about hiring an agent until you're starting to consistently be pulling in maybe fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollar creative fees as a composer, which is well over ten years of just constant career work. Like not even like just part time, full time ten years. You know, it takes a long time to to climb that ladder hierarchically with all the credits you have to build. Um, so it's at that point in which you'll also be finding some of the uh, films or projects you're going after are asking you uh, to please uh, only have your agent talk with them and if you are sure that in that scenario that's a job that you could definitely be getting maybe because you've proved it in the past a few times then start to look for an agent in that scenario but don't waste their time if you if you if you're delusional <laughs> yeah, don't think it's your ticket to success. Have, have scientific right. proof that you need to hire an agent, not a delusion. <laughs> yeah. So it thing. seems like you're there. Yeah, they're there not to help you, but you're there to help them. Like you want to be at the point where you're not relying on them, but they're just kind of helping. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you've got to. It's got to be a tasty enough deal for them to want to get involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If it's like a thirty. Thirty dollar gig. <laughs> That's them getting thirty cents. Yeah, let's say Why all would they spend their time on that. Let's say all you need them to do is to go in and uh, negotiate uh, with them uh, in order to uh, butter up some terms that you were trying to get and um, f make firm the payment amount. And um, that's only, only re going to require them going in there, and then they already have you. You already have, or they already have a template contract from your attorney that they can just do some modifications on most agents are able to do those kinds of modifications and uh, let's say that's all they're doing I still see that as about a fifteen hundred dollar you know compensation for their time so at ten percent that's a fifteen thousand dollar creative fee so in the in the indie film business a fifteen thousand dollar creative fee is very high that's for you know a film with a probably a um, little bit out of the loop A-list actor or a top B-list actor, you know, like these days maybe Michael Rooker, <laughs> like top of the list B-list, you know, or someone that's been out of the loop in the A-center. So, um, or it's by a director that's, um, you know, a, a, always a winner. And so they've gotten a bigger budget. And so uh, the fee that they're giving you is well worth it. So... Um, those are the points, yeah. I think when you uh, and I think uh, Rich Aitken, uh, mixing engineer, um, also mentions that agents don't find you the work. I think that's important to mention. <laughs> agents, uh, there are agents who find you work. But there's about three of them <laughs> on this planet Earth that, that do that. Um, you have to understand if they have like twenty, thirty, forty, fifty people in their in their stable, when a when a gig request comes in, when they've got something that comes in, it's usually because one of their clients brought it in and they got too busy. Oh, what do I do now? You know, they ask their agent and the agent's like, okay, that's all right. Well, let's have, you know, Tim do it, you know? And, uh, and, and, and you can imagine that conversation is not going to go down to about 40 or 50. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
so the, the the idea that you're going to get work from an agent is really for just their top like three to five guys in their in their stable. Um, the rest of them are there for the when you get the work and you need the agent to go in and help you put, put mm. finalize that deal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Got any more questions? Oh yeah. Let's see a, a big old stack. That's a <laughs> big stack. Keep this them coming. <laughs> <laughs> what did you uh, want to talk about there, uh, Kyle? One of the things I had uh, was kind of a, a broad question for you guys, but something I found very interesting. Um, something that, like a, a live performance, whether you witnessed it in person or you maybe you just saw it maybe after it was recorded somewhere, uh, a favorite live performance for like an actual orchestration that just touched you in a certain way, really kind of, whether it was just the way it was conducted, if it was an older piece that was just performed in a certain way you just really loved and you weren't, you weren't expecting that. So I just want some of your guys' thoughts on that. Maybe something you guys, like I said, either saw in person or in video. Yeah. Well, so there's this YouTube video um, that I saw when I was first getting into trumpet playing. It was Wynton Marsalis plays the Carnival of Venice with um, the Boston Pops. Uh-huh. And then he also does a duet with uh, Sarah, is it Sarah Vaughn, the singer? Sarah McLaughlin? No, 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 no. Uh, Sarah Vaughn, the jazz singer? Yeah, jazz singer. Yep, uh-huh. yep, Sarah Vaughn yes. on Autumn Leaves. Oh, wow. And so it's fantastic, like jazz and classical trumpet at its like peak, you know, Winton's mm. prime. Was that Winton? Oh, boy. Yeah, he was winning Grammys for both classical and jazz <laughs> in that period, same time. Wow. So that was a really awesome concert and inspiring to me as a trumpet player. And then as I got into film writing, music, and composition and stuff, I came back to the video and look who's conducting. It's John Williams on really? the podium oh, conducting the wow. orchestra. That's awesome. It's, uh, it's kind of oh, funny just, wow. you know, from... You know, beginning till now on both perspectives, it was a really informative concert. So that would, that would be my favorite. Went to Marsalis with the uh, Boston Pops. Very cool. Very cool. Mine would be uh, many years ago. I went and saw Esapekka uh, Salonen when he was running the LA Phil conducting. Uh, I went and got tickets for the front row because I was. I'm not literally like right. No one wants to buy those tickets because you're, you're, you're below the stage. So you can't really technically hear the the right mix. But uh, I wanted to be able to hear all the instruments really well. So there I am sitting underneath, mm-hmm. as, right there. You know, coat tails like flapping in my face practically. You know, <laughs> and uh, he conducted Bartok's The Miraculous Mandarin. And there's a point in that where. Uh, Bartok has got the orchestra built up to such a fury a level that that the, and I was with my wife at the time and uh, it got to this inc- incredible loudness level and thickness of sound so massive um, and I turned to my to my to my wife and I said my god you know like I yelled her my god and she said what <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean that was just you know that's what awe striking is. The hairs go back up on your neck, and you just you, you, you you're experiencing something of the pinnacle of human achievement. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. Esapekka Salonen and L.A. Phil at the Dorothy Ooh. Chandler Pavilion here in Los Angeles, nice. uh, conducting Bartok's The Miraculous Mandarin. Very awesome. Very awesome. Cool. Is it all for you, Steve? Are you thinking of? Um. Let's see. Um. You're talking about orchestra, like yeah, an orchestra yeah, thing. Orchestra. Yeah, when I, when I was younger, I would go to like a lot of times. I lived over on the in New York City, and we would go like every Sunday. We would go to this like uh, in New Jersey pack. They're called NJ Pack, and they would just give performances of, of all sorts of composers: uh, Rimsky Korsakov and oh, and cool. Tchaikovsky. And we we always got to see like whatever they had for that week. They you know one of the symphonies, the Fifth Symphony, I think Tchaikovsky. And yeah, I just remember. Like enjoying that every week, you know. Very cool. Very cool. Seeing that. Yeah. Now, Michael Brian Stein asks, uh, "Does anyone uh, can anyone recommend any cool boutique musical instrument manufacturers, plugins, or instrument manufacturers? I mean, for instance, you have that thing you blow in. What's that again? Oh, the um, I have the Melodica Men's Melodica. Yeah. So the Melodica Men are a famous um, YouTube internet duo, and they play covers of famous songs but as melodicas you know it's kind of like a harmonica but with a piano keyboard and you blow into it with a tube yeah so it's like a piano but with dynamics and a little more 
raspy. It's it's got the wind reed, so it's a really fun instrument. <laughs> um, I got that straight from them, and when I ordered it, I asked them to sign it just as a special thing, and so they signed wow. it. So I've got a an autographed melodica man, melodica man, melodica. Oh wow! Cool. Next time I yeah. order something from the manufacturer, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sign it. You know? Yeah, I asked um, the makers. I've I've got this gold trumpet mute from um, I forget who. Like it's not Humsenberg, but it's the other one. But I asked him to sign it, and the guy who invented it didn't want to. <laughs> uh, so, uh, really? So there's a percentage uh, chance that it's not going to happen, but, but you know you're going to get a percentage of yeah. your. I've got my I've got my name on my trumpet mouthpiece too. It's ten bucks to engrave it. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, oh. I'm totally into that stuff. Very cool. Some of the ones that others recommended were uh, just to get this rolling. Uh, Mitchell Gibbs recommended a company called Sound Dust. So this is one of these cool boutique musical instrument manufacturers. Um, they probably make uh, you know virtual instrument plugins that are interesting. Oh, we're talking virtual. Yeah, yeah, I can be virtual too. I mean, but it could okay. be both. I mean, his question said, "Cool boutique musical instrument manufacturers." Yeah, I suppose you don't. You can manufacture the instrument once with programming, and then yeah. <laughs> digitally <laughs> recreate it, and that's called a plugin. Yeah, there's this really good um, DC flute manufacturer on Instagram. I think it's like Dizong. I'm not sure, but if yeah. uh, Michael wants to reach out, I can send you his Instagram. He makes really nice, you know, Chinese side flutes with the vibrating uh, membrane. Right. Really wow. awesome, fantastic sound. I have I have a one recording with a Chinese DC, I think in G. Nice. It's just the most vibrant, exciting sound. Oh, nice. You know, probably under forty bucks. Brandon uh, Kutnikov recommends Sound Iron. Sound oh, Iron yeah. has a lot of cool little instruments. What was that wrench and spiel? Oh, <laughs> that yeah. was a funny little... I forget who made that. Uh, but, yeah, uh, that might have been from Sound Iron. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. That might have been from Sound and, Iron. Uh, they have a lot of unusual instruments. Yeah, I, I know I've recommended this before, but Post Human is really nice. Uh -huh. Just because you, oh, yeah, you, know, you put it on super quiet in the background, it just fills things up. Yeah. Really nice. Um, Andrew Martin says, does Bastel count? They make some interesting things. And uh, so check that out, Bastel, B-A-S-T-L. Yeah. Uh, another one is Folk Tech, F-O-L-K-T-E-K, -E and they make custom electronic instruments. Cool. I uh, I was at NAM this year, and um, they had some really cool instruments. They had this plastic bugle for like thirty bucks. And it sounded fantastic. The P, the P trumpet. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a, yeah. I think it was the same brand as the P trumpet. Okay. You know, it was a valveless bugle. Yeah. Played fantastic. Sounded just like brass. And then they also had, for children, mm -hmm. the beginner trombone, which is the, the actual bell slides forward and down. So it's just one tube. It doesn't loop. Oh. And then they have uh, like a regular pitch trombone, but it's sized down. Somehow they messed with the harmonic, so it sounds like a little, you know, regular. B flat trombone, but it's about this big. Oh. And then the kids move to that, and then they can move to the regular trombone. Oh, okay. So I guess if you want to either get involved in trombone or use the move instrument it. as an un unusual instrument, yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's actually really easy to play too because you don't have to stretch so far. And then also, um, like didgeridoos, you can get a didgeridoo for pretty cheap. Um, mm -hmm. The PVC pipe ones r work really well with okay. the. Uh, rubber mouthpiece you don't even need a wax mouthpiece oh great and then they just put a little bell flare on it you know and kind of yeah. decorate it up you get it super cheap and it sounds fantastic oh wow great um, cool. really easy to you know get into your score for different effects or even just raw yeah on the wall behind you is a called a Boron that's from uh, Ireland oh, that okay. one is from Dublin oh, mm. when I was there and uh, traditionally you are supposed to uh, play you know, you, 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 you put a um, kind of like their drumstick beater in your hand and it's like kind of two-sided so you go boom 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 okay. so you can get uh, let's see I have to illustrate it to everyone here it's like a boom, sheep boom, bone boom boom, boom boom yeah sheep bone or whatever and you can get a right but uh, actually traditionally you're supposed to use the neck bone of a Welshman Oh, <laughs> so you have to go uh, raid some graves, you know, if you really want to play it traditionally. Speaking of PVC pipes and moving away from tradition, <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, that's funny. And and did you have any uh, other recommendations? I have some more here. Um, when it comes to, I'm a little more versed in like guitar amplification and effects and that route. So boutique effects that I've been looking, f you know, at or checking out or kind of been a fan of for a while. Uh, Earthquaker Devices, they're a pedal company. 
Say uh, that again? Uh, Earthquaker Devices. Okay. Uh, hmm. They do, uh, you know, any kind of guitar pedal, essentially, phasers, delays, uh, overdrives. And beautiful sound. Uh, really, if you're looking for more, a more boutique. I mean, it's kind of a, a odd phrase, but they're, they're all hand-wired, they're all handmade, so you are actually getting as close as you can to that really, you know, uh, sort of homemade, in a sense. Yeah. Regard, but they're. I mean, they really are blowing up a lot. They're uh, they're very popular uh, right now. I say over the past two years, they've really blown up quite a bit. I've seen a lot of guitar. There's a lot of famous guitar players using them on their on their boards now. So. Mm -hmm. There's a pretty cool website. Uh, I don't know if it's popular, but it's called Plugin Boutique. Oh yeah. And you could just go on there. They have thousands of just. Oh sure, Plugin Boutique. Yeah. Plugin Boutique. I think it's yeah. Plugin Hyphen Boutique or something. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. I go on there every once in a while. Oh you yeah. Know? And it's fun to just see what that what's out there. Oh heck yeah. Um, another one uh, that recommended by Brooke Geisler is indexdrums.com. He makes everything himself in his workshop by hand, and his creativity is astounding. Awesome. Um, Lelia Walker uh, says, House of Musical Traditions. I guess look that one up. Yeah, probably a local place. Uh huh. And John Heatherington suggests Sonic Couture. Sonic yeah, they make some sample sets. Yeah. I've heard yeah. yeah. Um, another thing you can do is you know go into contact or a really really good uh, sample playback unit and and record your own sounds mm -hmm. and make make your own. Yeah, it's, it's not too hard to you know drop a sample, even just a wave file into the yeah. sample and, editor. And like with the make stuff a basic that Steve one. uses, he uses the Serum. Oh yeah, you can like drop that in there, and I think Serum does it do like granular synthesis. Yeah, you could yeah. take an audio file and just throw it in there and yeah. do whatever you want. You could turn it into <laughs> a three minute evolving soundscape. You know, and it's fantastic with all all digital all the digital doodads that you could imagine. Yeah. Uh, this Tuesday, I want to invite everybody to uh, join us in virtual reality. If anyone uses virtual reality, uh, we're, we have a weekly uh, composer meetup where we uh, just hang out and flip virtual burgers <laughs> uh, and um, talk about what you're working on and what's the latest with you. That's Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And uh, most of us will be there, and we hope to see you there. Now, uh, Jamal Brashen Camp asks, uh, I know I'm new to the group, and this may be an amateur question, but has anyone here taken the Berkeley online courses for the film, TV, and video games degree? I'm just looking to see what people thought of it as a degree, and if the school time and money is worth it. So I have a lot of friends over at Berkeley, so um, what I'm about to say is certainly a, a not a slight against Berkeley, specifically. But it is pretty much my belief that the profession of film scoring is something that you, that you have to experience in order to learn. And uh, it's not like music theory. Um, so... I'm not a big proponent of taking film scoring, getting film scoring degrees in that sense. Um, but I will mention that I have a upcoming uh, seminar this summer where we're going to be teaching uh, everything you need to know about film scoring in six days. And there's going to be 40 plus classes, each one a master class. And there'll be numerous guests who are uh, icons and titans in the industry. And um, you'll be able to get basically your entire film scoring education and probably more because it's going to be given to you by masters who are working professionals um, in a matter of six days. And that'll be July 22nd through July 27th. And I hope to see uh, some of you there. Awesome. Yeah, I was going to say, um, when he was asking about that school, um, I don't know any specific experience, but just schools in general, you know, with, with how things work with, you know, copyright and stuff, when they give you movie examples or projects or kind of homework assignments, it's always going to be cut away and, and sh you know, shaped in such a way that obviously they're legally compliant, but that means you're working on stuff that's, you know, either really old or not very trendy, you can't do a lot with it, you certainly <clears throat> can't really go around showing it. So, you know, even if you're going to build a portfolio, school's not great for that, you still have to get your own work so that you're working 
in the here and the now, and that you can have materials that you can show off to other people. Yeah, and because uh, film scoring is a trade in profession, you really need to learn it from people who are in the field. And so I always highly recommend you apprentice with people who are wor the best working professionals out there or intern with them. So like, you know, come out to LA for the summer and uh, f find some people to work with and help out. Um, so I think that's a lot better, uh, Jamal, than perhaps you know, I didn't. So also, another thing that scares me about all that is all that student debt, no, the price. which is real. And under current law, you can't um, ever get rid of that debt. So it's going to haunt you for however many decades it takes for you to pay it back. And and probably, you know, the more prestigious the piece of paper is supposed to be, uh, the more in debt you're going to go in getting it. And I think you can really learn everything you need to know about film scoring, uh, for example, at our Total Mastery, um, Total Scoring Mastery uh, seminar uh, this summer uh, from working professionals. So that's what I highly recommend. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in this week, and uh, we'll see you next week. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. <laughs> see, see you later. guys. See you. Thanks, guys.